just like uh, Chris, I would never be Catholic and she would never be anything else. Why don't you worry about that? Be close to somebody with you. Strong. Good morning. Good morning. We've got a couple, like, sort of announcements. I don't know if they're full announcements. Um, Nancy Hughes just brought up a good point, and I'm going to float it and look and see what people do. But maybe next week after church, we could put up some of our Christmas decorations. Right. Yeah, that's the week we usually do it. Right, and we're here. So if you're if you're if you feel so inclined, it's easier when people are here to get some stuff done than to call people during the week and hope. So uh, in particular, the tree. That's what's many hands make something what? Sure. 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 Yeah. Many hands the are the devil's work. play thing. Light <laughs> work. work. Which do we have lights on the tree? Yes. So it's a pun. <laughs> okay, so so there's that. Um, I know that Laura Swyler isn't going to be here today. She got a COVID shot and he's got a fever and doesn't feel well. That happens sometimes. Sandy is is recovering from COVID and actually I I think she's doing okay at this point, which is really encouraging. Um, we were worried that some of our other medication might might make that compromise for her. Um, there was someone else who told me, oh goodness, that they were going to be here. Yeah, Julie is out of town. Julie Paul is in Missouri. Texas. Texas. Is it really? I'm, okay, Texas. I stay corrected. And I, I that might be it, but I feel like it's not. But it might be. So, hey. I have another announcement. Yeah, let's do it. Um, thank you to all of you who signed up to write something for the Advent booklet. But not thank you for those of you who haven't turned it in yet. So please, <laughs> please get it to me this week. I really need it. I want to be able to distribute the booklets next Sunday, which is the first Sunday in Advent. And that's what it's all about. So if, if you need my email address or if you want to just to me over the phone, that's fine, I don't care. Um, but I really do need to get it like today. If it's an advent book and advent starts and we don't have the book, it makes the book less effective. That's entirely true. Which means you've got to get on it if you signed up. We did a, a message a couple weeks ago about obligatory versus supererogatory. Remember that? Yeah, I yeah. So if you signed up to do the Advent book, that's obligatory. So don't leave a child drowning in a pool, and the child would be Susan. That's right. I've already written six of them myself, so oh, okay. I, need, I need help with the rest of them that you signed up for. Thanks. It just struck me that if you weren't here this Sunday we talked about it, that was really just Yeah. 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 <laughs> Anything else? John is here. That's exciting. Was it last week we talked about progress? I think it was. Wasn't it? And we talked about the, the lie that progress is real and the lie that progress is not real. And uh, John can attest to that. He got stints put in his heart that probably in the 1700s they would have probably just used leeches on him. So, uh, and I don't think that would have worked well. So, uh, in that sense, progress, progress is real. So, uh, it is what we think it is. Okay, so, I'm forgetting some important, but I'll just bring it up later if I can't remember it. Let's prepare, what's that? I know, I should have notes. Let's prepare our hearts to worship God this morning.
to worship. Love is a word that can be a verb or a noun. A lot of words are like that. Words such as answer, ache, blame, care, garden, guy, hate, question, and end. All can be nouns or verbs. Are we nouns or verbs? We are people, persons. We are things. We are nouns. But what are we without any verbs? Like if we are doing anything, like speaking or listening or sitting or sleeping or breathing? Yes. What are we? Persons? Things? Nouns? If we cannot attach any verbs to ourselves, I guess we are just bodies. Bingo. It's the verbs. We are nouns, but we must do verbs, or we are dead. As the Bible says, faith without works is dead. Our first hymn is a gathering hymn we gather together. In hymn number 336. to become what and who we have been charged to be. 
Thanks be to God, we are forgiven indeed. Thanks be to God, we are offered new life. Let us now sing, Now Thank We All Our God, hymnal number 643. <laughs> the name of the prophet and how the prophet went to the principles and, and enacted this change and motivated the people to do something different. All the specifics are right there. It's a, it's a two-chapter book. But I want to read you chapter one, and this is part of like the meta-message, and this, this is what we want to get out to our friends and family members to try to help them live more confidently in the world. Because you don't have to be, um, you can believe in God's omnipotence, omnipresence, you can believe in God's power, you can believe that the Bible is inspired, the inspired word of God, without believing in inerrancy. And inerrancy is a flawed dogma that only became a dogma uh, because of slavery and the lead up to the Civil War. Uh, Christ's Church in the World didn't argue about the inerrancy of Scripture uh, until the United States decided it wanted to go to war with itself over institutional slavery. And then Southern ministers found verses that, what did those verses say, say to slaves? Be good to your masters, obey them. So therefore slavery is good and the Bible is never wrong. And we know the Bible, not a word in the Bible is wrong. And the Bible tells, 
accepts that slavery is real and tells slaves to obey their masters. So when slaves run to freedom, what are they doing? They're disobeying God. It's a sin. So that whole dogma, that whole thing comes up uh, because, uh, in large part, because of American um, desire to control slavery. Now, having said that, watch this. Because you... I didn't notice this. Like, I had to go to grad school to notice this. And I'm going to show it to you, and you're going to be like, how did you not notice that? But you didn't either. <laughs> I'm just going to read the first verse, and I'm going to ask you a question. Haggai, I'm going to read uh, 1 through 13 of the first chapter of Haggai. But uh, listen to the first verse. The Lord's word came through Haggai, the prophet. In the second year of King Darius, in the sixth month, on the first day of the month. Who wrote the book of Haggai? If, the, if you receive a message from God, and you go and you tell Mike, because Mike needs it. The word of the Lord comes to me, and I prophesy to Mike, because you need it, Right? Do I say the word, the Lord's word came through Jeff, and Jeff spoke to Mike? What do I say? The Lord's word came to me. 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 The Lord's word came to me, and I spoke to Mike. But the first words in the book of Haggai, the Lord's word came through Haggai, the prophet. So what does that mean? What do you infer from that? Yeah, a ghostwriter. Yeah. <laughs> it's weird, though, because this person who's writing this knows the very day these events happen. So what do we know about the ghostwriter? Or what can we infer about the ghostwriter? He was there. It was his wife. <laughs> so, so all of a sudden, just from this, and I'm not saying I'm right. I'm wrong all the time, amen. But you can infer just from this first phrase that maybe Haggai didn't write Haggai, but someone <coughs> really close to Haggai wrote Haggai. Why would someone really close to Haggai write this down? Why would you do it? Why bother? Writing is not, I mean, we weren't publishing things. Why write it down at all? To share. To share with who? The world. I mean, the community. If I if I say words to Mike, and, and Mike and I argue about them, and I end up going, you're right, Mike, or Mike ends up going, you're right, and we walk away, where do the words go? They're gone. But if Lee overhears them and says, oh, my word, Mike is brilliant. Mike. Changed my thinking. I'm going to write it down. Where do the words go? They, they have the potential to remain. So not only do we think that perhaps, we're not sure, but maybe Haggai didn't write it. Because Haggai didn't say the word of the Lord came to me. The book says the word of the Lord came to Haggai. But it's someone who loves Haggai, who we think was probably there, and you're going to see from the context there were a lot of people there, but they wanted us to read it later. It's so important what he did that it's not just important then. It's important forever. Now, you don't have to, I can be wrong about all that. Did, I, I don't know any of that. I'm inferring it. But doesn't that bring that thing to life more than just, no, the book's Haggai, Haggai wrote it. Why would, you, why would you stop there? Don't just look at it, read it. I spent a lot of time on that introduction. Okay. <laughs> Haggai 1, 1 through 13. And tell me this isn't relevant as we read through. The word of the Lord for us today. The Lord's word came through Haggai, the prophet. In the second year of King Darius, the sixth month, the first day of the month, to Judah's governor, Zerubbabel, Sheltiel's son, and to the high priest, Joshua, Jehozadak's son, 
This is what the Lord of heavenly forces says. These people say, the time hasn't come, the time to rebuild the Lord's house. Then the Lord's word came through Haggai, the prophet. It is time for you, is it time for you to dwell in your own paneled houses while this house lies in ruins? So now, this is what the Lord of heavenly forces says. Take your ways to heart. You've so much, but it's brought little. You eat, but there's not enough to satisfy. You drink, but not enough to get drunk. There's clothing, but not enough to get warm. Anyone earning wages puts those wages into a bag with holes in it. This is what the Lord of heavenly forces says. Take your ways to heart. Go up on the highlands and bring back wood. Rebuild the temple so that I may enjoy it and that I may be honored, says the Lord. You expect a surplus, but look how it shrinks. You bring it home and I blow it away, says the Lord of heavenly forces, because my house lies in ruins. But all of you, hurry to your own houses. Therefore the skies above you have withheld the dew, and the earth is withheld its produce because of you. I've called for drought on the earth, on the mountains, on the grain, on the wine, on the olive oil, on that which comes forth from the fertile ground, on humanity, on beasts, and upon everything that had its produce. produce. Zerubbabel, Sheltiel's son, the high priest, Joshua, and Joshua, Jehoshadak's son, along with all who remained among the people, listened to the voice of the Lord God, and to the words of Haggai the prophet, because the Lord their God sent him, then the people feared the Lord. Then Haggai, the Lord's messenger, gave the Lord's message to the people. I am with you, says the Lord. Word of the Lord.
remember in uh, high school, and I went to a Christian school in, uh, in Birmingham, Alabama, Christian high school, and we went to Bible class every day, and I remember one debate uh, really seared into my mind. I never forgot it. It informed me for the rest of my life. And why we were debating this, why we were spending time in Bible class, I don't know. We were a Christian school. We could pray whenever we wanted, but we were having a debate led by the Bible teacher uh, about school prayer in public schools. And it was a given, the, the teacher was saying, you know, um, <coughs> how, how tragic, how awful it is that prayer is not allowed. And of course, prayer was allowed at that point. But we weren't having teachers lead it. And I remember raising my hand and I said, uh, Mr. Ruth, isn't it true though, if we have prayer in schools, then if your teacher's a Buddhist, you're having Buddhist meditation in school. And if your teacher's a Hindu, you're having a Hindu prayer in school. And etc. etc. I said, isn't that a problem for you? And I'll never forget the moment. This is what he said. And my buddies <laughs> raised their hands and said, and he kind of nodded, and, he, and they said, well, we won't let them. It's Christian prayer we're talking about. And that was the truth said out loud. <clears throat> that was the secret truth said out loud. And I never forgot that, because it was never about prayer. It was about forcing people to pray like me. That's what it was about. And I always, I say that story because I didn't grow to become strange or different evangelically. I found that I was from the beginning. But one of the points of, of divergence for me and the evangelicals who, who, who I grew up around and spent so much time with comes from this next reading. And we debated it. I remember having... Uh, being underage, having a beer in my dorm room, arguing with my evangelical friend about this next reading. When I shouldn't have had, I could have got in trouble at school for having it even if I was of age. I was not of age. I had a beer. This is how we were. We argued the Bible over illegal beer, okay? And didn't think of the irony of that. Um, but but this, is, this is one of those readings where I zigged and the evangelical community zap, the one that I grew up around. See if you can see why that might have happened. I'm reading from James 2, 14 through 26. My brothers and sisters, what good is it if people say they have faith but do nothing to show it? Claiming to have faith can't save anyone, can it? Imagine a brother or sister who's naked and never has enough food to eat. What if one of you says, go in peace, stay warm, have a good meal? What good is it if you don't actually give them what their body needs? In the same way, faith is dead when it doesn't result in faithful activity. Someone might claim, you have faith and I have action. But how can I see your faith apart from your actions? Instead, I'll show you my faith by putting it into practice and faithful action. It's good that you believe God is one. Ha! Even the demons believe this, and they tremble with fear. Are you so slow? Do you need to be shown that faith without actions has no value at all. What about Abraham, our father? Wasn't he shown to be righteous through his actions when he offered his son Isaac on the altar? See, his faith was at work along with his actions. In fact, his faith was made complete by his faithful actions. So the scripture was fulfilled that says Abraham believed God, and God regarded him as righteous. What's more, Abraham was called God's friend. So you see that a person is shown to be righteous through faithful actions, not through faith alone. In the same way, it wasn't Rahab the prostitute shown to be righteous 
when she received the messengers as her guests and then sent them on by another road. As a lifeless body is dead, so faith without actions is dead. The word of the Lord. It's really cool um, that we have, we are a church that was really born out of another church, Emmanuel Presbyterian Church on Central, a church that uh, Chris and Joyce served for how long? 10 years? 13. 13 years, but who's counting? Yeah. 13. Uh, as co-pastors and a church... Did, did you ever, you attended Emmanuel for a while, did you not? Yes. Did, and Peggy <coughs> did. Any of you others besides those two? Really, you did too? I got married in that church. Did you really? Yeah. Wow. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask, I think I'm going to give you the mic. Oh well, I don't know that it'll reach well. Oh dear. Um, Peggy has told me a couple of times the story of what really started, what, where the seeds were scattered for the beginning of this church. And if you can sort of, as you, we talked about before church, sort of plant that flag for us collectively. If you can't hear, I will try to bring the mic. I'm going to watch and see if anyone's going like this. But if you can kind of speak up. Yeah, just if you'll kind of tell, because you, the beginning is really interesting to me with this James passage. So what, where, what group was it, and why school. did you feel sort of led to maybe separate a little it bit? It was a Sunday school class. Okay, so a Sunday school class meeting at Emmanuel. Ten people? Thirty. Maybe thirty. Okay, thirty or so people. This would have been, well, fifty-something years ago, fifty-two years ago maybe. Yeah. Okay. And, and so there started to get, there was a little bit of turbulence over. Was that there was a problem with some people in the black community. We had very few blacks back then. Mm -hmm. And also some of the uh, Hispanic community because they were down in the valley and we were up in the heights in right. the new church with a fairly affluent church. And Frank Blatta, who led this Sunday school class, and everybody adored him, and, and we just kept bringing more and more people into the class because everybody was concerned about what was going on with other people. And they wanted something, they wanted to do something. So we had, we had black speakers come in and talk about the black community. Um, we had Hispanic leaders. This was during the time of Char Tiarena, Tiarena. Yeah. and people came, and um, everybody in the, in the class was concerned about what was going on in the world, really. So, But then, then you stopped just going to class. Yeah, we went into the community to do things, um, and I feel like we made a significant impact on Albuquerque at that time with just a few people. Yeah. And um, then, do you want me to tell the rest of it? <laughs> I like where you're going right now. Okay, <laughs> yeah. and then more and more people came, the Sunday school class got bigger and bigger and bigger, and um, we began to bring in people from other ethnic groups <coughs> that were members of the Sunday school class. And then the elders of the church became very frightened because we were doing things outside the church, being vocal and talking about how things needed to be changed for those people. I probably mentioned to you six of the people in our Sunday school. It was a time of zero population growth. And six of us adopted children. That's a big we, one. Although we had children. Right. And uh, some adopted several children because we thought that's some way we could make an Im impact on the world in a small little way. And then the session decided that we were being um, very disruptive 
I want to just stop right there. That's perfect. And we know, we know that uh, Chris and Joyce got there a few years later and fixed everything. So we know that this is all a happy ending. And that, that our church, because it was made with perfect people, has never had an issue. So Emmanuel wins and we win. But, but having, that being said, the word disruptive is perfect. Let's take a deep breath right there. And, and the, one of the reasons I wanted Peggy to, to give that perspective this morning is next week we're going to do a We Remember service that I hope becomes an annual thing here. Uh, it's the last Sunday of the liturgical year in Christian churches around the world. And um, what begins... The Christian, not the secular calendar, but the Christian calendar every year. What begins it? Advent. Advent. So after next week is the first Sunday of Advent, which is essentially New Year's Day for Christian churches around the world. So my hope is that on Christ the King Sunday each year, uh, New Life pauses to remember your roots. Remember where you've come from and the people that began this church and what their vision was, and yet, knowing that actually, I was joking earlier, we're not all perfect, and that vision's constantly going to have to be adapted. And we wanted a church that was different. Right. We didn't want a Sandy, a Presbyterian, or another Emmanuel. Okay. Your name and names? Okay, so, which is great, um, very disruptive. Um, so, so the reason I bring this up is I, I, part of me really wants to vindicate that if conflict is maybe a little bit too strong a word, but turbulence between these people that were doers running around doing stuff it, to the point of adopting children and what cynically I would call the speakers or the thinkers and I want to show you the roots of that sort of dysfunction. And probably what, what James is saying is that you've got to have faith. You've got to have a core that you believe in, that you pledge allegiance to, that you ground your hope in. But if all you do is sit in your chair and think about it, then it's, it's like a corpse. It's not that it's not there. It's there. It's just not living. Do you see my point? Yeah. It's not that it doesn't exist. It exists. It's in the chair. It's there. You can point at it. But what is it doing? It's not. It's not even breathing. Okay? So this is a weird exercise that I'm going to start with. And I might lose some of and I'm sorry. I get kind of esoteric sometimes. Here is the kind of a statement that I grew up believing in and, and professing. God's holiness, justice, and righteousness require fervent prayers of confession. God's holiness, justice, and righteousness require fervent prayers of confession. I'm going to ask you to listen for the verb. God's holiness, justice, and righteousness require fervent prayers of confession. What's, how many verbs are there? Require. God's holiness. What's that word? Is that a verb? No, it's an adjective. I'm not even sure. Is it a noun or an adjective? God's holiness, justice, and righteousness. Right. Yeah. Objects of prepositions? That's not a preposition. <laughs> Require, there's our verb, fervent prayers of confession. Here's how I would say that today. We're called to confess as God is holy, just, and righteous. What's the verb? We're called to confess. I believe that historical Christianity 
spends time on nouns. We do the nouns. Confession, prayer, holiness, righteousness. What are some other religious sin? What are some other nouns that we grew up with? Salvation, purity, prayer. Prayer, I mean, prayer as a noun should bother us. We should realize that, like, we should have a little piggy bank. You put a penny in when you use prayer as a noun, and you can take one out when you use it as a verb. I think that the Christian church generally, it, throughout history, has tried to identify itself and explain itself to people. And you use a lot of nouns when you do that. And you use a lot of adjectives before your nouns, right? Righteous anger. God's angry, but it's not bad anger. It's righteous anger. So, so we we've done this throughout our history. We have a, the PCUSA has a book of confessions with, I think it's eleven. I think now that are in there, historic documents that. Uh, that affirm what we believe, and there's nothing wrong with that. But there are a lot of nouns. I read through the Westminster Confession this week to sort of uh, ground myself in what I was going to say. It's a lot of nounage. <laughs> there's a lot of prayers, but not a lot of pray. There's a lot of confessions, but not a lot of confessing. Well, it's all confessing in a sense. But in my world that I live in, I'm a James 2 guy. And I really believe that while Jesus spoke and taught with words and used language, his real teaching is in his life itself and what he gave up to love us. And so to me, when I read of Jesus' life and when I'm trying to learn from what Jesus would want me to do with my life, I'm looking at actions and I'm looking at verbs. And I'm trying to figure out what I'm supposed to do. What do you want me to do? It's all well and good. I can be right with what I think. Well, what good is it if I don't do anything right? And I really think that that's what happens a lot in our churches. And it's happened for a long time in our churches. We want to teach people right from wrong. We want to explain it to them. We want to tell people what... what we want to explain our beliefs now. But what we believe is what we do. Believe is a verb. Are you following me? It's esoteric, I know, and it feels like maybe I'm just talking. But, and, and James connects the two. And that's why I'm saying, please notice, James does not say faith without works doesn't exist. He doesn't say that, does he? It's there. It's just not doing anything at all. It's there, though. If you don't want to do anything, take comfort. Your faith is there. It's just dead. What does Jesus do with the dead? What does he have the power to do? Isn't it, isn't it strange that part of Jesus' message of his life is, is being raised from being dead, not from being wounded or personally insulted, but from being dead, from being dead, to being and doing. And so, and I, you know, this is a message that Thanksgiving is a weird one for me. And it's always got this, and my family always did it right. My mom and my dad always did this right. Like, you get together and you make the meal and you pray and you give thanks. We, we did do that. And there's so often that's a cursory thing. And I'm sure there were years in our family growing up where it was cursory. And I'm sure there were years where it was heartfelt and meant, like anybody. But I think it's more common these days to think of Thanksgiving as a noun, a date and a holiday an event, something we go to. Where are you going for Thanksgiving? 
and we think of it as that thing we have to go to, and sit with family that maybe we don't want to see that often, maybe we do. If, we, if we're really purely motivated and on our game, we will have a moment together with that group of profound giving of thanks. We'll verb together before we eat together, which is a verb, but we'll verb together Thanksgiving moment. If we're on it, if we're on top of it, we'll thanks, we will do thanksgiving together. But it kind of begs the question, doesn't it? Because if we're really on the ball and not just kind of on the ball, we know that it shouldn't be a one-off, that we have to circle on a calendar. We know that we should live Thanksgiving as an adverb. We should be giving thanks. And not only in the right kind of cranberry sauce, and not only in a not dry turkey, but in the challenges we face, and the difficulties we face that we wouldn't choose, and the hurt that we have to endure to grow. If we're on our game and we don't have to circle a calendar for Thanksgiving, and we're giving thanks, then we can give thanks for the things that we really would change about ourselves if we had the power, because they think that it's been given to you for a purpose of some sort. And if you're on your game, you know that, and you can thank God for it even though you wouldn't choose it. And on and on it goes. And I really think, you know, in a perfect world, new life probably wouldn't exist because in a perfect world, the Sunday school class 52 years ago informs the thinkers, the faithers, the nouns, that there are verbs to do. And the nouns listen to the verbs and say, well, we've been nouning this whole time, and we didn't realize until you told us that we could do these verbs. Thanks. We don't even want to do them. But we didn't know. And in a perfect world, the verbs inform the nouns and make something really beautiful. But it's very hard. It's real. Didn't you guys do like a roof downtown? You put a roof on some building? On the um, boys' detention center because it didn't have a roof that didn't leak. I mean, I, come on. I don't want you to. That you're embarrassing me. <laughs> one of many things. Right? So, so it's really hard in the moment to take that verb when you're a comfortable noun and be informed by it. And I think it's also really hard when you're verbing and you're adopting a child and you're putting a roof on a detention center to go back to the people stuck in the nouns and say, love you. Let me tell you about what went on. It's okay that you weren't there. I mean it. It's okay that you weren't there, but this is what we did. Really hard. Well, they solved that problem. <laughs> they did. They did. And, and thanks be to God, God makes the good out of it all. And we, we, we confess that. So that's my message. I, I'm hoping that this week isn't so much something that you've marked and you meet the people and you make the food. I mean, we're going to do that in my house. We're going to meet the people and make the food and sit down and talk and get caught up and do all of that stuff that's really marks the passage of time in a family. But I'm hoping it's a springboard for you. And really the message is thanksgiving in all things. Thanksgiving in what we would choose and in what we would not choose. Thanksgiving in the, the verbs that you don't want in your sentence but that are there, and the response that you can embrace in that moment and do something about it, because you can. You can do something about it. So, peace, thanksgiving, blessings, amen. That's pretty esoteric. I understand that. I was a philosophy major, and sometimes I get out there a little bit. Um, 
If I was going to get real esoteric about it, I would have talked to you about Jesus as a verb and his life as a verb. And, and that's just, that gets way up there. So that's like free form poetry. Okay. Um, so I know we have people sick. I know that for a fact. Um, I know that some of you that are here are uh, 100% earning your best, and I know that. And so we need to lift each other up. And, you know, a message of Thanksgiving is one thing um, when you're doing great. It's another thing for the pastor to ask you to live with Thanksgiving if you're fighting COVID or worse. And so I know that's not an easy one, and that's one you could take and work on uh, between you and God and the people you love. Um, I'm going to do the thing where I pray and I get quiet and I invite you to raise your voice in prayer. And um, when I feel like I've, we, we've all had an ample opportunity, I uh, will close. Let's pray. Lord, we come to you, we pray for so many of the the circumstances in our lives that we would like to see changed. We want to be more successful. We want to be more responsible. We want to be healthier. We want to be um, more well-liked, more well-received, more respected. So many things that we would want and that we would change in our circumstances right now. In the same way, You've already touched us. We're here. We're with people who care about us. You've brought us to this place. And for that, we are grateful. We are thankful. We are blessed. And so, Lord, we take this moment to offer up our prayers of thanks and our prayers of intercession to you today. situation in Israel will be ended, hopefully in a good way, and that somehow something good may come out of all of this. My family will be driving from Texas um, for Thanksgiving, and the weather is not supposed to be real good for a safe trip here. Dear Father in heaven, I thank you for this congregation and giving me some place to go for that love. I am thankful today because I counted eight men sitting in here today and it seems like we were down to about one. So um, I'm very thankful to see eight men sitting in this congregation today. Dear God, this is uh, the Wednesday, I believe, is the 60th anniversary of the JFK assassination. And <clears throat> there's been some, in, uh, some footage of interviews way back when and as someone was interviewed, this man was, said, well, the one thing about this is I hope this will never happen again. Something like this will never happen again. And so I think we've lost our innocence as a country at that moment. And we still face all kinds of challenges, and those things did happen again. But I pray, just like this man, I pray that this doesn't happen again. I pray that we are able to, and if not, I pray we're able to meet our challenges and move on as good people in this country without too much uh, altercation between our thoughts and our politics and everything else. I pray that we can come together. Listening to each other is important. Help us learn to listen.
Lord, our prayers today go out for healing and for confidence. We pray that Sandy and Joyce and Kumar, Laura, and others in our congregation who might be struggling physically in some capacity, that you would give them confidence in your plan and healing immediately in their lives. We pray for safekeeping and travels and that as we encounter our loved ones in this season, that we would be doers of peace and thanksgiving. That we would be your instruments at work in the world. We pray all of these things in the name of Jesus the Christ who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Let's present our tithes and offerings to the Lord. Song of harvest. 